So today we'll take a look into event sourcing implementation in Clojure once again. I already had a video on the topic on the channel, so you can take a look uh, in more details there. Uh, in that video I covered uh, mostly the pure event sourcing. Uh, that's when we have uh, our uh, events stored and then we don't store any resources or projections. So each time we need to present like an entity or resource, we basically read all events and then do the uh, calculation of the projection uh, on the fly. Uh, but obviously that approach has its own limitations um, and more specifically uh, it's quite hard to maintain uh, efficient reads. Uh, so once your event table is growing uh, you need to calculate the projections in runtime over and over again, and then uh, some more complex queries, uh, different parameters, uh, and uh, when you need to look for different data in different events, that could get quite complex, and you need to do self-joins, etc. Um, so to fix that problem, uh, we'll take a look how to introduce a new entity in our system, uh, which will be uh, the resources table. And we will uh, update, uh, we will insert our events and update our resources in the same transaction so it's consistent and we don't introduce eventual consistency. So let's briefly uh, cover uh, event sourcing once again. Uh, the idea is that we don't have uh, mutable uh, resources or rows in our database. So we only store events when something happens. We just log that in our database. Uh, so for that, we'll use um, an events table. And uh, I'm using Postgres as database here. Uh, and in the events table, we'll have event ID, event type, aggregate ID, aggregate type, and payload, which is a JSONB, so we can store uh, our events in any shape we want, and then just create that. So rows that we insert in this table will never uh, mutate. So uh, you record that, and uh, that's forever. So what we do next uh, is, yeah, we, we have uh, our insert event function, which just persists that event in our table. And then when we need to get the, uh, the aggregate, we will get all events by aggregate ID, and then we run the projection on top of those events. So let's take a look how that's implemented in Clojure. So first of all, we have this insert event, which is pretty similar, uh, simple, right? We just have uh, insert into events, and then we update, um, like we, we basically storing our event. Uh, the only thing we do here is to update the payload into JSONB uh, format, uh, so, our database driver understands that. Um, more interestingly, uh, that's our uh, apply event, and one of one of the ways to implement that is to use uh, multi-method enclosure. So we have our def multi apply event, and then we use our aggregate type and uh, type of the event as uh, a way to dispatch uh, the implementation of apply event so uh, for for example for resource type order and event order created uh, that will be the logic of our apply event function uh, and then uh, and as you can see here we're ignoring the first argument and that's basically because we know that order created should be the very first uh, event type in the sequence of allowed events uh, per resource so we can basically ignore the state here and we create the initial state in this function. And then we have order paid and order dispatched as two other uh, um, order uh, event types uh, examples. And in this case, we uh, kind of have the state already and then we updating the state. Um, we're getting the payload from the event and then we uh, updating the uh, updated that column to the created that of the event itself. Um, kind of similar logic uh, in in their 
order dispatched. Uh, so in, in this case, it's quite simple um, logic in those apply events. In real world, uh, you can see more complex uh, business logic in the apply event of the particular event type. So once we, we defined all the functions for different event types, uh, then we are using the project function and then we uh, basically doing the reduce right here, we uh, apply um, we apply event uh, and then we apply that to state and to the list of events that we have. So the full sequence is right here. Uh, get events by aggregate ID will basically do the select from the database, uh, getting all the events for the aggregate ID uh, and then we basically just converting their payload back to closure format and then we run the project and as you can see here in the project we're basically doing the reduce on top of their events vector and then we're calling the apply event so that's what I called in this readme file a pure event sourcing and we can take a look into our uh, tests so this first uh, test right here, event sourcing test, uh, is basically testing the pure event sourcing. So we have uh, order ID and then other order ID. For the first order we have three events, order created, order uh, paid and order uh, dispatched. For the other order ID we just have order created. Uh, once we inserted all of those into the database, we can uh, run some queries and we can validate uh, the data. So what we're doing here, we're basically getting the um, events by aggregate ID for the first order and aggregates, aggregate ID for the second order. And then we see that uh, we're getting their order uh, resource back uh, and but but basically the database is storing the only the events it's not storing this mutable data we're just getting it back uh, in this format so in, the, in this case as I said uh, we need to do the uh, projection on top of the events each time we query for the order resource by ID uh, which could be inefficient so uh, what's the goal of this video is to create a new uh, database table and we call it resources and then here we have the resource ID, resource type, payload and then last event ID that will be basically uh, we will understand which event was processed uh, that represents the state of this resource in the database table. And then as this row will be mutable, we'll introduce the updated add uh, timestamp that will update each time we apply a new event uh, for that table. So the implementation here will reuse most of the things that we've seen before. Um, and now we're looking into this publish function. Uh, we'll get our event and we will basically do two things. So we need to insert the event as we done before. So this block here, uh, execute uh, a SQL query to insert uh, the event. And uh, to do that safely, uh, we want to open a transaction and then we want to calculate a new uh, projection. So here in update resource, uh, we getting the list of events and then we calculating the new payload of resource by applying the project, project function on the sequence of events. Uh, the interesting idea here is that we only want to get events uh, from the uh, particular event ID. So you see this condition, it is uh, when, where ID is greater than last event ID from the resource and uh, that will be the kind of list of events that were not applied yet. Uh, 
uh, the idea here is that in normal flow, uh, there'll be only one event in this list. But when we introduce this pattern, maybe we already used event sourcing for a while. And in that case, uh, on the first run uh, of a new event insertion, we want to calculate the resource from the whole sequence of events. And this, this logic will basically cover that because in our existing resource, there won't be any resource ID, event ID uh, stored. So we will basically have the full, full sequence. So um, yeah, that's the update resource. Uh, we're getting the list of events to apply. We're getting the new payload. We're calculating that new payload. And then we uh, um, executing the update on the resources table. We storing the new payload. We're updating the last event ID to the uh, last event ID from the events list. And we're updating they updated that to now. Um, you could ask if that's uh, kind of atomic and safe uh, from the concurrent uh, transactions perspective. And yes, it is. And that's because we need to look into the lock event that we calling at the very start of the transaction. So. Uh, even before we inserting the event, we doing this lock resource right here. And the idea here is that we do two things. First one is we inserting into resources, but if there is a conflict uh, on the particular ID, we uh, basically do nothing and we ignoring that. But if there was no resource previously created, we just creating a, like a dummy row with basically an empty payload and event ID is zero. Um, that's just to make e the, the next statement easy because in this one we're doing the actual locking and we're using the select for update. And select for update we will basically introduce a, uh, a lock on the uh, database row and our concurrent transactions will will wait for each other on, on, on this particular uh, statement. So we doing the locking here, um, and that's why the rest of the sequence is safe. So we can insert event, only one transaction will insert event, and then we updating the resource, and only one transaction is allowed to update here, because we previously selected for update the, the same resource by ID. And that's it. That's basically the whole idea. Uh, one extra uh, nice feature that we introduce here is schema validation. So in Postgres, uh, we usually store the uh, payloads as JSONB, uh, and database is not helping us there to validate the shape of the JSON payload. And it's quite easy to make a mistake to store data in a different format or maybe like Mesa field or something like that. That's why it's much e easier and more reliable to validate the schema on the client side. So idea is that we use this validator throw um, and then we basically use Mali to validate the JSON payload. And we do it in two places. First one, we want to validate that the event payload itself is valid. So we're using the event schema um, and throwing a message that it's not valid if it's not. And then down there, when we do update resource, once we calculate the, the payload uh, of the resource after the event, after applying the new event, we also do the validate or throw, but now we're using the resource schema and the resource payload here. So we kind of will abort the transaction if uh, the calculated projection is not valid against the schema. And yeah, we roll back the transaction. We won't re re record the event insertion. We won't record the update of the resource. And 
uh, that's reflected in the event sourcing um, with resources test. So um, the data that we insert is almost identical to the previous test, but now we can uh, query directly from the resources table and we can get the result back. So let's let's see. And also, as you can see here, I'm using the order resource schema and I'll pass it to uh, my publish function. It's actually going through the depths component uh, right here. So you see me, I'm, uh, uh, I'm doing a sock into depths and I'm putting the resource schema inside. Uh, once that's present, our publish function will do the validation of the schema before the database update. So here again, two orders, order ID and other order ID. We um, um, we inserting the uh, three events per, uh, per first order, and then one event for the other one, and then on each publish we can query directly the database, uh, get resource by ID, um, and we now getting it back from the database itself without uh, without the need of the runtime uh, projections. So that's for the other event, for the paid event, for the dispatched event, etc. So yeah, that's one of the ways of improving the event sourcing. Uh, obviously, if you uh, it, it depends on the goal how you use event sourcing. Sometimes uh, you'll say, I want to kind of like move to uh, secure as pattern. In that case, kind of like a transaction and locking is not what you want because in that case you kind of want eventual consistency so you probably uh, will end up creating a separate process asynchronously that will read your incoming events and then updating the projection but in that case uh, you need to understand that your um, resources table will be eventually consistent, not as strongly consistent. Uh, but again, it depends on the system that you're building, on the requirements, etc. In the system that I'm working, it's um, uh, the event sourcing is basically used as a nice way of uh, uh, having an audit log. So we kind of see everything that happens in the system and then a nice way that we can rebuild the system uh, the data from uh, the source events, right? And the problem that we're trying to solve here is that our queries, read queries, uh, on the row events is, are not efficient. So we want to introduce a resources table that we can use instead of row events to optimize the reads. Uh, but yeah, we uh, introducing the locking uh, in that case. So I hope that was kind of useful. Um, as usual, I'll post that as a separate uh, project in my GitHub repo. So all the code will be available there. So you can go and check, check it out yourself um, and maybe try to run the tests and see how everything is implemented. Um, let me know what you think um, if you're using event sourcing in some way in your systems and maybe some suggestions how things could be improved. That's all from me for now. Uh, please like, subscribe and leave comments. That really helps. And also there are ways to support my channel and my work by sending some donations on the Buy Me A Coffee or GitHub. Uh, thanks a lot. See you next video. Bye bye. Have a nice one.